Many men have grown up with the misconception that if you are a man, you should restrain your emotions. I do not have this problem. If I see a Hallmark commercial, it usually ends with me crying. But my experience is not the same as most guys. Uh, several years ago, GQ magazine shared an article that was written by a woman helping men know when it is acceptable for a guy to cry. For example, she said that it is okay for a guy to cry if you are in extreme pain. Uh, like if a piano falls 50 stories onto your foot, that would be okay. She said it has to be at least an eight on the pain scale. She said it also is okay to cry at certain films. Like for example, if you did not get a little misty-eyed at the end of Avengers Endgame, there's something wrong with you. I would also say for a dude, it's okay to cry with the old Yeller movie, uh, Remember the Titans, uh, Hoosiers, and of course, Empire Strikes Back. She also said it is okay to cry when you hold your newborn. Oh. newborn. I definitely cried when I was asked by the doctor to cut the umbilical cord. It was so incredibly gross, I cried. <laughs> the big question is, what about sporting events? Because guys really get invested into sports. Can you cry at sports? And she writes, only if you're actually playing on the field. And only if you're the team that won. If you're the team that lost and you cry, that's whining. And you can never, ever cry if you're a fan. So pay attention, all of you Vikings fans. You need to heed this advice and make some life changes. And then finally she writes, what about arguments between spouses? And she says, sorry guys, but crying during an argument is kind of our thing. Now the article is very tongue in cheek, but here is the reality. In this coming year, if you are a man or you are a woman, you are going to encounter an acceptable occasion to cry, potentially more than once. Because following Jesus, despite the distorted depictions of Christianity that is often on television that suggests Christians never have problems and following Jesus makes all of the pain go away. The reality is that following Jesus does not mean you suffer less. It's supposed to mean you suffer better. A short text is going to drive our thoughts this morning. It's found in the first chapter of James. If you want to follow along in your own Bible, the brother of Jesus says in James chapter 1, beginning in the second verse, Count it all joy, my brothers. When you face trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I think rethinking our priorities is a healthy exercise, and I thought it would be a worthwhile exercise to look into Scripture and every time you see the word count and how it's used. So what does God's word really say about what really counts? Because it really matters how you decide what really matters. Especially if you're dealing with difficult matters. And the Bible says that your suffering counts. And James has two life principles in that short passage. One of them is inevitable, and one of them is an option. And here is what is inevitable. James says, you can count on trials. He doesn't say, if you encounter. He says, when you encounter, because you will. Dealing with trials and hard seasons of life is not an elective. It is a required course for every single person. Now, James is talking about trials that you encounter, not trials you create. Can we be a little honest? A lot of our pain is our own fault. Some of us 
are in financial stress right now because we gave in to greed or we didn't use good stewarding principles or we weren't putting God first in our finances and we created the mess we're in. If you do not steward your body, you will encounter health problems. If you are rude, if you are selfish, if you are insensitive, you will experience relational pain that you created. But no, no matter how much you try to follow Jesus and line your life up with the will of God, you will go through seasons of suffering. Because we are not immune from the effects of the fall. We live in a cursed world. And the way things are, are not the way things God wants them to be. They are not the way things are going to be. When Jesus comes back, he's going to make things right again. But right now, we live in a cursed world, and we have not yet received our immortal resurrection bodies. So forget the distortion that you see on TV. Christians do hurt. Christians cry too. And they should. It's not that we suffer less. It's that we can suffer better. Forgive the pun, but... It's hard for me to suffer the Christian that acts like they never suffer. The reality is that this world is well served by followers of Jesus who have decided to suffer well. Let's so write this down. You can count on trials, so make your trials count. Because you can count on trials, those are inevitable. But here is the option part. Will you make your trial count? Trials are not always caused by God, and they are not always caused by Satan. But trials can and always be used by God and Satan. And the outcome is often going to depend upon your outlook. Look at verse 2 again from the New International Version. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. To consider is a Choice And that word consider comes from the Greek world of finance. It literally means to count, to evaluate, to determine the actual worth of something. So James is saying that suffering is a given. That's inevitable. But the option is whether or not suffering will be a gift. What is not up for debate is whether or not in this year... If you will experience pain, what is on the table this morning is whether or not the pain you experience will be transformative. One of the greatest British evangelists of the last century was a man named William Sangster. And at an age way too early, he was diagnosed with a disease that was progressive and debilitating and ultimately terminal. And he made four resolutions when he got that diagnosis that he faithfully kept until the day that he died. One, I'm never going to complain. Two, I will keep the home bright. Three, I will count my blessings. And four, I will try to turn this into gain. Because counting is a choice. Consideration is a determination. When you can't make it go away, when you decide to make it count. Now, this would probably not be the most popular sermon that I preached this year. But it might be one of the most important. And you might not need it right now, today. But you will need it. You will hit the wall. And you will be in a tough time. And will that be transformative for you? So I want to give you three questions that come out of this text that I believe can help. And here's the first. Ask yourself this. What can I learn? Because when we suffer, the first thing we want to know is why. And God is big enough to handle those questions. He's big enough to handle our, our doubts. He's big enough to handle our complaints. You just read through the Psalms, and God is, is big enough for his people to say, Why, God? Where are you? God, how long, God? In fact, the very next series that we're going to be going through is going to deal with those very kinds of questions. And the series is called, But What About? We can express our questions 
But we need to be careful not to cross the line and put God on trial. God is not the one in need of justification. We are. God doesn't need to run the universe in a way that makes sense to me. He doesn't have to explain to me his sovereign choices. And that's part of the theme of the book of Job. And you get to the very end of the book of Job, and Job had crossed the line with his whys. God finally said, don't tell me how to run the moral universe, Job. You see, even when we are in the dark, God has given us enough things to remember when we, are in, when we were in the light that we can trust his goodness. Even when we can't understand, we can trust his character. Can I, can I be blunt? I, I think that enlightenment is overrated as a pain reliever. It's simply not true that if I just knew why I'm going through such a hard season, that I would feel better. If, if you knew why your dad abandoned you and your mom when you were a baby, would that have made growing up without a dad easier? If, if you knew why your parents split up, would that have made that less painful? If you knew why your wife was diagnosed with breast cancer, does that mean you wouldn't be afraid anymore? If you knew why that guy had a drinking problem and why he chose to get behind a wheel when he was inebriated and ran into your loved one, does that mean going to their funeral will be less difficult? You see, knowing why is overrated as a pain reliever. There is something better than gaining an answer to why. It's gaining wisdom. And I think it's interesting that right after James says, let your trials be a source of joy, they can mature you. Right after that, he says this in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. See, when people go through tough times, I have been asked the question, Mike, do you think that God's trying to teach me something? Let me answer that. God is always trying to teach you something. That's why when I go to the hospital to pray with people, by the way, I hope someday I can go back to the hospital again to pray with people. But I'll pray, Lord, help them learn what you want them to learn. The truth is that it is in the classroom of suffering that we are often the most teachable. Suffering can teach you to not be self-sufficient. Suffering can teach you to value relationships deeper. Suffering can remind you that what matters most are the people that you love the most. Suffering can give you insight into the gospel. Suffering teaches you the difference between happiness and joy. Suffering teaches you to reprioritize your lives. And I think most importantly, suffering teaches us to keep eternity in view, not here and now. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Paul says, I consider, that's our word, that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us because suffering is temporary. You ain't. And anything we go through that intensifies our hope and our longing for resurrection is counted for us, should be at least, as a blessing. Because you don't always get to choose your pain, but you always get to choose what you're going to do with it. What can I learn from this is a transformative question. But so is this question. How can I grow? James says to count it joy because this is an opportunity for you to become more complete, more mature. Now, the thing that James is assuming is that being mature is actually a goal that you have. He, he assumes that that's something that you really want. And on the surface, I think we would all say that we do. If I said, how many of you, if Jesus doesn't come back one year from today, want to be more spiritually mature than you are right now? I think every single one of us would raise our hands, but our prayers speak otherwise. Lord, I want to grow. I want to be like Jesus. Lord, I want you to take away all of my problems. I want you to fix the people that I don't like. And I want you to make all the tough things go away. So what do you really want most? Increased comfort or developed character? Because to have one, you have to forfeit the other. Years ago, there was an interesting science experiment in Arizona called the biosphere. They, they built this huge 
dome and they put inside of it several many environments like a rainforest, a, a desert. They even had a lake that was representative of an ocean. And, and then they put these scientists inside of this. They were supposed to live in there for two years to see what life would be like in pristine, perfect conditions. The only conditions they could not reproduce was wind. And what they found out was that the trees that were growing could not develop properly. And as they began to grow, the lack of wind kept them from having the strength that they needed to hold up their own weight of their growth. So they fell over. Now, you know this in life. Resistance builds strength. And you want to get more fit, so you put more weight on the bar. Because the greater the resistance, the greater the potential for de developing strength. And what's true in the world of nature and what's true in your own biology is just as true in the spiritual realm as well. Listen to Paul again as he wrote to the church in Rome. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And you know this is true. Who are the people that have mentored and helped you the most in life? Who are the people that you admire the most in life? The people who have never had problems? Or the people who weathered their problems and finished well? So what is your highest value? Comfort or character? There's a man who... Writes often for the New York Times. His name is David Brooks. He doesn't write as a Christian, but what he does write often has a Christian underpinning to it. And he wrote a couple years back about our culture's worship of happiness. He said, We live in a culture awash in talk of happiness. And he described one three-month period in the year 2016 when more than 1,000 books were released on Amazon on that very subject of happiness. You know, when people look back on their past, they don't only talk about happiness. We do. We remember the good times. But it is often the ordeals that we go through that seem most significant. People shoot for happiness, but they feel formed through suffering. And I love that last line of his. That's why Paul would say, if he was standing here in the pulpit and not me, and he was speaking to you, he would tell you that the trial he wanted the least is what formed him the most. Paul had a trial. He referred to it in scripture. He called it a thorn. It was probably some kind of physical malady. And it made his life Hard. And here's what he said about it. 2 Corinthians 12. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. So that Christ's power may rest on me. And God did not rebuke Paul for asking that it would be taken away. But God said, Paul, I want you to grow in spite of this. Because the fact is, the only way that you can experience the sufficiency of God is if you are in a season of insufficiency. You see, God doesn't give you strength instead of weakness. He gives you strength in the midst of weakness. So that when you are squeezed by life, what is going to come outside from the inside is supposed to be the character of Jesus so that instead of being counted out, you actually become somebody that can be counted on. Because the last and final powerful question that you can ask in a season of suffering is this, who can I bless? Now, suffering is going to want to make you self-centered. It's going to want to make you look inward and think about just yourself. But one of the beautiful things about being an engaged member of the body of Christ is that you don't have to suffer all alone. The Bible says we weep with those who weep. And when you have one of those times where it's okay to cry, you don't have to cry alone. 
It's one of the reasons why being here is important. Following Jesus is a team sport. The Holy Spirit is going to empower you in community to receive ministry. But the Holy Spirit is also going to empower you in community, even in a season of pain, to do ministry. You know, we hear the phrase a lot, hurt people hurt people. That's true. But here's the other side. Hurt people are often the very best to help people. I read this interesting study about people who deal with multiple sclerosis. This university took 132 sufferers of MS and put them into two different groups. One group were, were taught coping mechanisms and skills to deal with their MS. And the other group received a visit once a month from somebody who had MS who had been trained to encourage multiple sclerosis sufferers. Which group do you think did better? Well, they concluded neither. <laughs> they said neither group did that much better, but the people that were trained to encourage MS sufferers did a lot better. And the conclusion of the study was that giving support improved health more than receiving support. In fact, one teacher said it, it was like those, those MS sufferers that were encouraging the other group went through a, a transformation. And that shouldn't surprise us because we were made in the image of God. We are at our fullest and our best self when we live out of who God made us to be. And God is not just a taker. He is a giver. God is a replenisher. God is an encourager. God is a dispenser of mercy. And when we live most true to who God made us to be, we are at our very best. So Paul could say in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given to us. So a good prayer to pray is this. Lord, how can this trial I'm going through expand my heart's capacity to love people? What can... What I'm going through, do to help people, lo help me love people that are going through the same thing I am. You see, every single one of us in this room has a story. And someday, your story will be told, and that story will include the hard seasons. And will it say, that season got the best of them? Or will it say, that season brought the best out of them? I think one of God's desires for us in helping us become, as Paul said, complete or perfect, not lacking anything, it just means you're growing in maturity, is to learn to surrender our suffering to God. God will not always take your suffering away, but he will always redeem it. Write this down. You can count on God to make your suffering count. You can trust the character of God. You can trust that he will grow your character. And I know this is true because the God I'm talking to you about is a God who understands suffering. Not theoretically, but personally. He didn't stay aloof from pain. He came into this world in the person of Jesus and he entered into pain. We worship a God that still has scars. He knows what to do about suffering. And let me show you what God is going to do. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in the 6th verse. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. Even though you have to endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Through your faith, Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. And, and pay attention to this part. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You, you think and say, it will bring God much praise and honor and glory. But no, it says it will bring you 
Much praise and glory and honor on the day when Christ Jesus is revealed to the whole world. You are going to stand before Jesus and he's going to say to you, thank you. I never let go of you and you never let go of me and I am proud of you. And so if you can't make it go away, make it count. I don't know when you're going to need this sermon. Maybe, maybe in a couple months. Maybe not even until Thanksgiving this year. Maybe next week. But you are going to need it. And my guess is that there are people in this room right now that need it right now. What can I learn? How, how can I grow? Who can I bless? Three simple prayers. Teach me. Grow me. Use me. Which one do you need today? Would you stand up? I want to pray over you. And here's the deal. I'm going to have you start the prayer. I'll finish it. But you're in the midst of something right now where you need to learn, you need to grow, you need to turn it into ministry. So you start the prayer and I will finish. God, we know scars and struggles are part of our path. If they won't go away, help us grow anyway. Help us take the hard times and the pain and surrender it. And grow from it. And make Jesus look good. Thank you for your faithfulness. You are a God that can even make our suffering count. We pray this, God, in Jesus' name.